God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I lift you up, exalt your holy name. Oh, you're worthy, Lord, you're worthy, Lord God. I praise you. God is so, 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 so good. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to be here today. I'm so grateful for you. And uh, I just, I'm just like, wow, God's good. And as you know, um, well, first of all, let me say thank you to Brother Votal. Uh, and let me just go back a little bit farther. Sister Heather and Brother Billy Strong, uh, they started our quizzing program gee, 10 years ago or something like that. And uh, you weren't here. He wasn't here. But he showed up, took over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he has just, in, in the last three years, I believe it is, he has just run with it. And I am so grateful for Brother Votal uh, having the burden to, to and, and the, the, um, the intentional discipline that it takes to make that program succeed. And I just want to, again, he didn't get any accolades up here a while ago, but I'm telling you, what he's doing for our young people and for the parents, uh, I'm telling you, it cannot be substituted. It can't. Anybody else want to take his job? J-O-B. It's, it's W-O-R-K. Believe me. I mean, it's just an, I'm, I'm thankful. And you know what? Let's give him a hand clap. Honor and pray. Yeah. Applause. Let's give him applause. All right. So I'm, I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for all the worship that I've uh, seen here. But more than anything... I'm thankful for the power of God that I've felt throughout this day. You may be seated. I'm going to take a moment, uh, and this is kind of impromptu. I was told earlier this week that I was to pick somebody out. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I forgot to. So um, I'm going to just talk quickly about our past, real quickly. And I, I guess if there's anybody that can talk about our past, it would probably be me. But or my wife, uh, she'd probably do it better because I extrapolate and uh, exaggerate. I make everything bigger than it really was, and and not really, not on this. You can't. Um, I just want to say, first of all, I'm grateful and I honor all of you that have been here for very long. Uh, over the years, many have come and gone, uh, mainly because I'm a very hard-headed person. I know that sounds a little, a little, um, um, I don't know, self aggrandizing I don't know what you want to call it it's 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 just a part of me and let me explain my reasoning I am a steward of not just a calling that God placed on my life but I'm a steward of a work that God wants us to have in College Station and in doing so this is God's church this is God's body this is God's people I'm not gonna play games with it I might be fun I might be happy I might be shouting and people look like at me like, what in the world? I scare people the way I act. I'm sorry about all that. But, but let me tell you something. You don't play games with God's word. You don't play games with God's holiness. You don't play games with God's righteousness. You don't play games with God, anything, anything to do in the church. Period. I don't like it when I see people chewing gum inside the building. That's just me. I don't like it. I don't like, I, there's a lot of things I don't like. But I'm, I have to also know in my in my heart, I know that people are hungry, and they don't need somebody beating them up before they hear the Word of God. So I've got to be very careful. Those of you that just swallowed your gum, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm, I'm just this me, okay? I'm not trying to be hard. In fact, I'm not a hard person. You can ask my wife. You can ask, you know, don't ask my wife. Ask somebody else. But, uh, but I, I, I believe me when I tell you, uh, more people have left our church because I'm hard-headed about honoring and respecting the things of God more than people's desire than for any other reason. They get aggravated at me because I don't, I don't play their little games. I'm not going to play a game with it. This is not a game. This is the house of the living God. This is the church. This is the work of God. We don't play games with this. Amen? We're all here for the right reason, aren't we? I want to make it to heaven. Come on. I want to make it to heaven. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get there. I mean, you know, I guess there's reasonable. I don't want to kill anybody to make it to heaven, but at the same time, wouldn't probably make it then. But, but uh, I, I, it's just, that's just my, my mindset. We started Victory Church in our living room. If, for those of you that don't know this story, you must be new because you probably heard it. But uh, we started our church in the living room. Let me go ahead and tell you. And, then, and, and as I tell you these few moments, I've got a long message, so I've got to be short. It's not really long. It's just emphatic. Um, when we moved here, and this is all glory to God, that's what I was going to say and I didn't finish. Let me tell you something. If I say anything that makes me look good, you hear me. God is amazing. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. All glory goes to him, period. When we moved to College Station, I was, I was uh, doing air conditioning work, owned a few businesses over the years, and felt God call me to ministry. I had gone to school quite a bit, but never really finished in any one thing because I'm just that kind of person. I'm all over the place. I'm a master of nothing but an expert in a lot of stuff. So I don't know if that even makes sense. But uh, I, was, I had air conditioning license. I was working. I was teaching Bible studies. I was knocking doors, which is I don't really recommend that. But anyway, I was, I was knocking doors. I was standing. I was radical, fanatical, crazy, standing out on the street corner uh, all over Lufkin, Laurenburg, North Carolina, handing out flyers and pamphlets and, and just, just radical. Um, God gave me, obviously I was raised in a family of business-minded people. And then, of course, air conditioning was kind of one of the little cornerstones of our businesses. Um, and so he blessed me with that talent. I went to school for it. I'm thankful for all that. But I knew, and I, I've, I've tried to testify of this multiple times. Young people, you're going to school. Give God glory. Do not think you're going to school for your own, oh, look at me, look at me. It's for God's glory. I went to school for God's glory. I graduated God's glory. I did business for God's glory. And whenever given the opportunity, uh, and actually it was before the Church and Day program, I went to Brother Russo and I said, Brother Russo, I got an idea. And uh, I told him my idea. And it was about helping small churches and, and um, uh, home, what we used to call home missions churches, little bitty churches all over the district. I want to help these churches. So what we can do is have them, before they hire an outsider to come and charge them $75 an hour, tell them to call you or somebody in the district, and they'll contact me, and we'll go do the air conditioning for free. And he said, well, we got another idea. And so, it, long story short, um, we got called to do the Church in a Day music. Uh, music. <laughs> Wished it was, but I wouldn't have played very good. But anyway, Church in a Day air conditioning up at Harker Heights. And this is about 24 years ago, 23 years ago. No, it wasn't even that long, 22. I have to ask Brother Hendrick. Anyway, so they said they needed an air conditioning guy. Uh, my wife, my family, I've got pictures of it somewhere. We went up to Harker Heights, and from Nacogdoches or from Lufkin where we lived to Harker Heights, it's not a straight shot. You either have to go north through Fairfield or south through College Station to get to Harker Heights. And so the, going over there, we chose Fairfield. And coming back, I said, and, and this is just my nature, hey, let's go back a different way. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And we did that everywhere we've traveled. I like to go different routes. And um, sometimes that hurts. <laughs> but uh, and Google can't tell me anything. I'm like, Google don't know what she's talking about. And then I'm like sitting in traffic for two hours because Google knew what she's talking about. But uh, anyway, so we drive through College Station on the way back. And we sit at the Sonic there on Harvey and Texas. And something gripped my heart. I can't explain it. I don't even know how to explain it. I was sitting there thinking... I wonder if there's a church here. And I, of course, this is back prior to phones and internet the way we have it now. And so I went home and I got my little book out and I looked and there was, there was, a, uh, there were, no, I didn't even look at it first. I first I asked, I happened to be with another pastor and I asked him, hey, is there a church there? And he said, man, you know, it's crazy you ask that because that is one of our target cities. We, it's got a church, but it's growing and we need another one and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna pray about that. And he said, "Go pray." And so, we came back either um, that next week, I think it was. I'm, I probably should have wrote all this down. We came back and uh, come back with a with a with a burden. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it for people to understand, but just this longing, this in my heart, a knowledge that that God is doing something, and I can't explain it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And uh, th now you've got to, and I'm going to say this too. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, let me clip my fingernails because I've heard this story. I had, I had preached when, I got, when we moved to College Station. I had never assisted, evangelized, nothing. I had never held a title. I had just preached enough to get a local license, and that was a miracle that I got that. But uh, I fooled a bunch of people, I guess. I don't know. I didn't. I shouldn't say that. But we moved here. Uh, let me go back to when we moved here the second time. The second time I came, uh, my wife wanted to go shopping at Steinmark. And, uh, and we didn't have one of those in Lufkin, Nacogdoches. And so we, I, we took us to Steinmark. Right off the, right, one of the first things we did, we moved, pulled into town, went straight to Steinmark. And we walked in the door, and my oldest daughter said, Dad, I need to go to the bathroom. And I said, well, go. And I've always pushed my children to do things without, without me having to hold their hand. I want my children to be confident. 
want my children to be able to survive if I die because my wife's dad passed when she was 12 and so I always knew that I, I didn't want I, there's a possibility that I die when they're 12 and I don't want them to be uh, dependent upon me and some of you parents probably need to learn a lesson through that but anyway um, so my children my daughter said daddy you go to the bathroom and I said well go she goes where is it at I said I don't know ask that lady you ask her I'm like no you ask her and there was a sweet lady and uh, as you walk in the Steinmark you, that you walk straight in there was a ring of clothes you know with those racks of round ones and there was a sweet black lady on the other side and um, and I said you ask her and she asked the lady and she says you see pointing to the back right back left side of the store she says they're behind those, under those pillows and so Lacey takes off running and uh, I, I looked at the lady and God is God is an, an amazing God and he uses us sometimes we take glory in it and sometimes um, we look like an idiot in it, but anyway, but uh, I, I looked at the lady and I said, are, I said, how are you today? She said, I'm fine. I said, are you from here? She said, yeah. I said, how long have you lived here? Five years. I said, do you like it? She said, no. <laughs> I'm here with a burden. I'm like, oh, what do you mean no? I said, what do you mean no? She said, just people are prejudiced around here. And I said, you're not living for God. I said, you're not, <laughs> something's wrong with you. you know? And I mean, literally, I just said it like that. And I'm like, Boop, bite my tongue. I said, you're not living for God. She said, well, why do you say that? I said, because people that live for God aren't prejudiced. People that live for God don't look at color. People look at, I said, that's, that's, something's not right. And I said, do you go to church? She said, well, I, I've been here for five years, and we haven't found a church that we like. And I said, that's because you're not looking at the right spot. I mean, I was like, bam, 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 you know. And uh, long story short, uh, I talked to her and told her I was coming to build a church, and she was going to come to our church. And she told me, she was, and I know her very well and love her dearly. And she told me, a matter of fact, tone, we'll see. Sound like Donald Trump now, we'll see. But uh, I, I said, you're going to come. Well, it took me five years to talk her into coming to church. And for about, for about 10 of those years, for about 10 years, she stayed here worshiping, loving the Lord. Saw her daughter come back into the church. Her son and her husband never came. And I, I'm, I love that lady. She was a catalyst. She was a little straw, maybe, whatever you want to call it. But long story short, we moved to College Station. I had, I had no talent, no understanding about what I was really doing. I just had a great burden. Um, I'm preaching a little bit about this today. I didn't mean to. I didn't even know all this was kind of in my mind, didn't square away. But I'm just telling you that what we had was faith, not in ourselves, but faith in God. If it's, it's, been for, it's been said, it's a phrase that we should all know, if God calls you to it, he'll help you get through it. You will get through what God calls you to. And he will, he will give you the power and the ability and the, and the tools. You've got to do your part. He's not going to just sit back and, you know, it's like I always, when I was younger, I was a, maybe simplistic, but I looked at the things of God and I don't look at God, as, I never looked at God as, you know, putting a plate of food in front of us and getting a fork out and hand feeding us. You know, he, he's like, he puts it there, you've got to do your part. And so that is where we were birthed. And we came here, my wife and I, we, uh, and I'm, my children, I'm thankful. I'm not going to say a lot too much today because I'm going to say it more next weekend. But I'm thankful for my children. Uh, God has been so good to me to give me such good children and an amazing wife. Um, when I didn't know what I was doing, thankfully she thought she did. And um, it all ended up okay. And so today, uh, somebody asked me yesterday, would you do anything different? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. I would do a lot of things different. I would do more. I would work harder. I would be more, I don't know. <laughs> I would be so much more. I would, I would do so much more. But my, I say it quite a bit, my humanity hinders me. I want so much to have so much time and so much more energy. And, and I know I'd scare y'all, but I, I, would, I would love to have more energy and more, uh, more focus. And I would love to, I would love to be more um, a proper leader. I'm not necessarily a proper leader. I would love to, to be the, you know, the John Maxwell of Pentecost. I would love to be the, the you know, a whatever. I would love to be all these guys, but I'm not. And so I have to work with what I've got. But this is what I do know, and I want you to understand this. I know for a fact that God has given me five talents. I cannot live in denial of that. I can walk and chew gum at the same time. I speak English. I love people. I know the word of God. Amen. I can clap off beat. There's a lot of things. God, God has given me five talents. I am going to put my five talents to work for him, and I'm not going to stop until the day I die. That's just the way it is. Amen. So that's our past. I moved here. 
not all of our past. I'm telling you the rest, and I'm quickly moving on. First John chapter 5, when I get there. I moved here with a burden. We opened the church on June the 3rd. Did not know. Most of my life has been this way. Strange way things happen with me. I did not know when we started the church on June the 3rd of 2001 that that was actually Pentecost Sunday. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Didn't ever look. Didn't ever consider it. Just did it. The, the, the week we moved here, we started the church. We started another air conditioning company, and we bought a house. We didn't know anybody, just our realtor. We had been here a few days, found out there was a college student in town that we, might, that we knew, and so we reached out to him, and uh, he couldn't make it to our first service. No, he was our first service. He was our only student. He was our only, he was 16, no, I'm saying 16, 18 or year old student, new student in College Station. That's one, maybe one of the reasons why I love students. I could hug you, and uh, I love students. I believe that's one of the reasons why God put me here, to send students back where they came from as ambassadors of true apostolic holiness, apostolic doctrine, apostolic lifestyle. Amen? Amen. Y'all okay? Y'all okay with this? I'm not preaching. Cool? Okay. So that's one of the reasons why God moved me here. And I am not here to baby the saints. I'm not here to pat the saints on the back. I'm not here to give accolades where accolades are not due. I'm here to raise up warriors, lions in the kingdom of God, the next generation, people that will do great things. And I do not like playing games. I do. I do it all the time. I have to because I'm afraid I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. I do not like playing games with people. Some of you know you're not living right. You know you're not living right. And maybe you expect me to come and tell you, what, are you think, what do you think you're doing? Maybe that's what we, we need. But if I treated people, I would, I would always have to be juggling things. I just want you to know I love you. You can live a better life. But it's going to be a life that lines up with the Word of God. Not by your opinion, not my opinion, but the Word of God. And some of you are questioning things and doubting things. You're not prayed up. You're not filled up. There's some things wrong. You, it's your fault, not God's fault. Amen. You want to do things right with God, you get involved and you do the work of God. In faith. With giving Him glory. Amen. Amen. So all that was impromptu. Um, I think I need to stop because like I said, I've got next week. Is that Mr. Up, baby? I probably need to wait. Okay. First John 5, let's stand for the reading of the word. I honor the word of God. I'll tell you this much as well. I, I picked this up. Isaiah picked it up. I conceived it. I dreamed it. Whatever. I don't know how I did it. But uh, before I even started the church, I made up my mind. I'm going to love the word of God more than I love people. Is that okay with y'all? It should be. It better be. It's all over there. <laughs> Is that okay? I'm not asking permission. I want you to understand. You need to do the same thing. You need to love the Word of God more than you love people. Because as a pastor, if I love people more than the Word of God, I'll twist and turn and make it fit you. That's how we get big churches real quick. But if I love the Word of God, we're going to build people. Into what he wants them to be. Okay, so let's go John. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So in other words, if you believe in, in Jesus, you, you're going to be born again. You're, it's the way it's, you believe in Jesus, you've got to be born again. And everyone that loves him, that begat loves, loves him also that is begotten of him. In other words, if you love God, you will love him that came from God. That is the Lord Jesus. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep, everybody say keep, keep, his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep, everybody say keep, keep. his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous, and they're not hard. You, you, if they're hard if you don't like them, and they're hard if you buck against them. They're not hard. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Everybody say faith. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Everyone alive, everyone alive, if they're breathing, they operate on what we know as faith. Everybody. You don't have to be in church to have faith. Come on. So when you go, when you woke up this morning, you went into the bathroom, you clicked that, flipped that switch on, you had faith that would work. Otherwise, you wouldn't even have tried. You go to pay your bill online, you have faith in the system. That is, if, if you didn't, you wouldn't even try. You'd drive down and you'd, you'd, I don't know how you would do it, but you would do it another way. And that's, that's the way it is with everything. If you, uh, if you go to eat at a restaurant, we're going to go eat here in a little bit. And, and uh, I hope they're not down there cooking for me because I'd rather them be in here than cooking. But my point is, that ain't none of my business, I don't guess. But anyway, my point is, you, you, you have faith 
that the farmer that raised the cow raised a cow that you can eat. And it was processed in a plant that is disease-free, whatever, bacteria-free, virus-free. And it was brought into you, and it was kept in a certain... You have faith in a lot of things that got that food to you. That is the basis of life. Every one of us operate, whether it's in a spiritual sense or in a physical sense, we operate all the time based on faith. Everybody say faith. faith. James said that faith without works is dead. In other words, if you would say, ask me, I'd say faith is great, but works are better. Faith is great, but works are better. Faith is not a byproduct of what we believe, but it is a product of what we do. Faith, the word faith in the Greek means persuaded. Persuaded, it means subjectively, it means persuasion. What is your persuasion? Objectively, it means what I believe. It's it, people, if you, if you live long enough and you go into government buildings or go into contracts with the government, they're going to uh, write, they're going to ask you, what is your faith tradition? Okay, you're going to say, I'm a Christian. And they're going to say, wouldn't it be funny if they said, prove it. <laughs> what do you mean you're a Christian? Prove it. And so, Faith, though, is in, in this innocuous term that is cast about in religious circles that seems to cover all the basis when we really don't know, but my faith is in Jesus or whatever. That we, we can be very uh, um, blah uh, about our faith. Physically, we can have faith in ourselves. We can have faith in objects or machines, our trucks and cars. We can have faith in the government, all of these things. But all of these things that we have faith in, in this world, you're just playing a guessing game if it's going to work or not. Uh, Brother Walters mentioned this morning about uh, the uh, entropy, about things degrading. It's a, it's a weird, uh, it, it's the way all of this is going together, it's really amazing. But my point that I want to bring out is this week, my dad, I talked to my dad, and he has a truck that he has left in the barn for eight years. He retired at 70, immediately started having health issues, left it in the barn, barely drove it. And man, I went and picked it up, and it is <laughs> everything on it has to be replaced. Even the brake lines are dry rotted. It's just, it's crazy because when you don't use it, you lose it. And if you don't use your faith, you're not going, you're not, you're not going to keep faith. If you don't use your faith, you don't exercise your faith, you don't do something with your faith, your faith is empty, amen? You can talk about it all day long, but empty faith is not going to do anything. Today, today, many have put faith in many things other than God. I'm going to teach us for a moment. I'm going to instruct us for a moment. We put people, many, most people in, a, in the world, most people in the world, put more faith in the things of this world than they do in God. This should scare, it scares me. This is a scary, scary problem. It's, it's horrible. We go to the doctor. He says, take this little pill. And we say, can I get a three-year supply? We go, to the, we go to the lawyer and he says, sue them. And we don't even pray about it. We just sue them. We go to the counselor and they say, I want to tell you what to do. Come back next week. And man, we're writing our schedule out for the next three years because we want to make sure we don't miss it. But when God asks us to, hey, come unto me, all you that labor. I will give you rest. Hey, come and touch the hem of my garment. Hey, get into a place of prayer and a place of fasting. Hey, give up something for the holiness of God. Get your life in tune with God's will. We want to buck and we want to rebuke. We want to struggle with it. We want to blame the pastor for telling me what the word says. Well, that makes sense. Faith is truly the foundation of all of life. I'm, I'm going to try to hurry, but I, I want you to understand. Faith is truly the foundation of all of life, but it's more than just this life. Faith is the foundation for eternal life. If you don't do some things, you are not going to make heaven your home. If you don't make changes that please God, you will not make heaven your home. You, uh, listen, we did not, he did not deliver to us this big old thick book with 207, I don't know how many pages, 2,700, I don't know, I'm just guessing. He didn't give us all of this just to say, love me. 
He said, listen, I want you to please me. I want you to praise me. I want you to worship me. I want you to live. I want you to be a people, a peculiar people that is for my pleasure, not the world's pleasure, but mine. And our faith must be dedicated enough to the will and the work of God that we say, Lord, I want to do this, but I'm going to move myself away from those things into what you want me to do. We've got to get about the work of faith. Amen. Faith is for the doing. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I struggle with my title. I, I struggle with all my titles, by the way, for the part. But the title will help you remember some things. The title will help you put your mind in, in uh, uh, line with what that message was about. Because Friday of this week, on 2 o'clock in the evening, I want you to remember that faith must be, is for the doing. Faith is for doing. Struggle with this message title. Today, we, we need to take command of our faith. We need to recognize our faith is not about just setting it on a wall or on a shelf, but it is about putting our talent, doing our work, putting our effort into the will and the work of God, lining up our lives with his will. Church, believe me when I tell you, there is a lot of things that we could do, but we do them because we do them for our own glory. We do them because we want, but we do them for our own will, the way we want to live. But God is calling us to have faith in him, faith in his word, faith in his system, faith in his saving power, faith in his eternal, in the eternal life he promises us. But there must be some doing. Now, I'm going to tell a quick story. It's, it's, it's lengthy, but I'm going to make it quick. Alexander Graham Bell, almost everybody should know him. If you, was, <laughs> if you took normal history, nowadays I'm not sure if they make normal history. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm kind of confused about what is being taught, but, you know, whatever. Alexander Graham Bell was a very uh, talented, an amazingly talented person. He invented many devices, the telegraph the, what he called the audio meter, which tests for hearing uh, aids. He, I mean, I, 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 they, stu they got stuff in here I didn't even know. He, he, he developed the tricycle landing gear for airplanes. I'm like, I didn't know that. That's cool. A host of other machines. He, he served on the National Geographic Society. He was a prestigious um, founder of the magazine Science. But the most famous creation he had was what we know as the Telephone. I thought somebody would say it. Telephone. I didn't probably give you enough time. <laughs> he, was, he, he invented the telephone. You know, we call them smartphones. We don't even say telephone anymore. We just say phone. Where's your phone at? Give me a smartphone. We don't even think that. We just, but it, it, it's incredible. It's, it, it made him renowned worldwide since that date. And it also uh, made his family extremely wealthy. But Baal had an idea, and this is, this is the difference between faith and hope, or hope and faith. Baal had an idea that he could use an electrical multi-read apparatus that he hoped would transmit the human voice by telegraph that would work. Somebody's alarm is going off, and half the church is leaving me. They're like, is that my car? We will find out in a minute. They'll put it up here. I'll tell you what license plate it is and point my finger at you. <sighs> they, get, they didn't get it off. It's still on. But it made his family extremely wealthy. This is incredible. So, Shy, is it your car? I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. I, I'm just kidding. We need thicker walls, don't we? And longer batteries, better batteries. <laughs> Bail had this idea, and in March of 1875, he, he visited a guy by the name of Joseph Henry, who was the director of the Smithsonian Institute, and he asked for Henry's input about his device. And he explained the device to Henry. He tried to explain it all to him. And Henry replied that he literally said to the, to the phrase, you have the germ of a great invention. But Bell rebutted that he didn't have the necessary knowledge to get it done. Alexander, Graham Bell, inventor of all these other things, said, but I don't know how. 
it, really interesting, Joseph Henry looked at him and emphatically declared, scared Alexander Graham Bell, then get it. Do something. Thankfully, Alexander Graham Bell did something. He, he went to a, a, a school of thought, if you will, and reinvented what he knew and come to a conclusion that it could be done. He set it on the desk, and for months it sat on his desk. His father-in-law, who happened to be funding him, interesting little tidbit of knowledge, his father-in-law, who happened to see the potential in this young 29-year-old man, funded him, kept asking him, when are you going to file the patent? When are you going to file? When are you going to do something about it? You've got the idea. You've got the design. When are you going to do something? Oh, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Finally, his father-in-law got so aggravated, he went down. Let me get you the exact date. On February the 14th of 1876, he, on Bell's 29th birthday, and he filed the patent for him. Literally just a few hours later, another inventor came in with the same design. That is the difference between hope and faith. You can have it in here, you can write it down, and you can think about it. But until you do something, you have not got faith. You have got to turn your ideas, your thoughts, your desires, your prayers into action. You've got to move. You've got to shout. You've got to worship. You've got to pray. You've got to read. You've got to fast. You've got to do something. Nobody else can do it for you. We cannot get our minds uh, so content in the church that we have what was mentioned earlier, and I, I say it the crude way, heard salvation. You are not going to make it to heaven because of me. Yes, I will help, I will instruct, I will correct, I will do all those things. I will lead, I will do everything I can. But if you make it to heaven, it's because you have faith enough in the word and the will of God that you are willing to sacrifice. You are willing to pay the price. Here a few weeks ago, we had three people baptized in Jesus' name because they believed enough to move from hope to faith, to works, amen. And today, they are in the church today. I pray to God that they don't get content there because there is also the Holy Ghost that God wants to pour out on his people. But we must do something. It is not just going to randomly hit us in the middle of Walmart. It is when we pray and we fast and we surrender. Let me tell you something. Surrender is as much doing as, as writing a paper is. Digging a ditch. <laughs> surrender. Oh, come on now. Some of you, not, you're trying to wrap your mind around this. I said surrendering to the will and the work and the word of God is as much doing as if you was going out and getting your car and crank, cranking on it. Amen. Or digging a ditch. There is something about surrendering that God can work with. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm full proof of that. And I'm not saying F-O-O-L. I'm telling you, <laughs> although that might fit, I am F-U-L-L. -L. I'm proof that God can do something with anybody that is willing to do it. Surrender your life. Bell had faith, but his father-in-law had works. James, the brother, half-brother, I should say, the half-brother of Jesus, said in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. In James 2, he gives us three examples. The first one is a physical example. And this we are very good at thanks to Sister Sashelsky. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? The physical example. Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing. And you say unto them, Goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. Adios. Come on. What good have you done for that person? Your faith has done nothing. You don't want to, listen, let me make sure you clarify this. That's not even that's not even faith. Oh, we say it is. I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. No, 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 no. That's not faith. That's not faith. I, I, I don't know what you want to call that. That's a lie. But that's not faith. Let me tell you, let me keep going. And, and you say, goodbye, have a great day. I'm not going to help you. Now, someone may argue, some people, I'm jump down to verse 18. Some people have faith, others have good deeds. This is James' theological argument. Some say, well, I have faith, other people have good deeds. Okay, I'm, hey, we're all, all one part of the body. Praise God. 
But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. He gives us another example, theological example. You say that you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. That's awesome. You believe that there's one God. Even the demons believe and they tremble in horror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? In other words, he is saying there is one God and his name is Jesus Christ. We do whatsoever we do in word or in deed. We do it in the name of Jesus. So why would you not get baptized in the name of Jesus? There's no salvation. Acts 4 and 12, there's no salvation. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no salvation in any other name but the name of Jesus. You get better. Listen to me. I'm talking to a group of, of people that most of you I know, but some of you I don't. I'm telling you, if you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you are denying the oneness of God. You, get that, let that be in your mind. Oh, no, there's one God. Then prove it by your deeds. Prove it by taking on the name of Jesus Christ. How do you take the name on? Baptism in Jesus' name. He gives us one more example, and I'm hurrying. Don't you remember, verse 21, don't you remember that your ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, he almost hit this today, and I'm like, wow, this is crazy. The way all this stuff is kind of intermingling. It's God thing, you know? I love this stuff because we don't, we don't talk. I mean, we talk, but not, we don't we don't coordinate there we go we don't do all that stuff we just say lord let let your will be done and god lines things up for people to hear whether we listen or not is up to us but but he said he said by by abraham's faith he offered his son isaac on the altar now i want you to realize this this is very very important some of you are making big decisions right now let me show you something abraham took isaac to worship on the mountain and he goes up there, and you know the most of you would know the story or the narrative. I don't even like using the word story. Story kind of like, maybe not, maybe. It's a narrative. And so he goes up on top of the mountain, and he's getting ready to sacrifice his only son for the will and the work of God. God says, do it. You're going to do it, right? So he gets up there, and he backs up, and he pulls a knife out. He puts his son on there. He pulls the knife out, and he's getting ready to stab him. And God says, wait a second. Wait a second. And he says this. Because of his actions, hear me? Because of the things he did, now I know you. I know you not by what you say, not by what you feel, not by what you think, but what do you do? And saints of God, can I tell you today that God is not calling us to sit on a pew and just think to go out in the world and let it held and in, but God is calling us to be a, a blaze of glory to the kingdom of God in our present world, that we could shout and dance about the things of God, that we could give him glory in everything. God's, God's done amazing things for us. And some of them, and I'm, I'm a little excited, so bear with me. Some of us think they are little things. And when I say, um, let me, when I say little things, sometimes they are little things. But if you don't give him glory in the little things, he's not going to trust you to give him glory in the bigger things. We, we, let me, just let me give, give you something simple. You need to be thankful for the little things that God has given you. And you need to turn those things around and give him glory. How do you give him glory? Yes, you can in your own time, in your own way. Oh, Lord, it's just me. I'm talking. I, I, you can ask my wife. I walk around the house all the time saying, Lord, I love you. God, you're amazing. That's, that's giving him glory, right? God, you're just amazing. I walk up to my coffee machine sometimes. I'm, Man, thank you, Lord, for the coffee machine. I do. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of weird like that. You know, I'm, I'm, I put my shoes on. Whoa, thank God this is a rubber. You know, thank God for rubber. I mean, I just think like that. And I think we all ought to think. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But there is something wrong if that's all I do. Because what I am supposed to do is take the little blessings of God and take them around to someone else. This is what we're talking about testifying. Hey, you won't believe what God did for me this week. Let me tell you something. 
Y'all with me? Y'all still with me? Okay. It, you, we are supposed to take the blessings of God and mix it, intermingle it with our quasi-faith and do something with it. Tell somebody else about the goodness and the greatness of our God. Why, why does this matter? Because we live in a world full of people that do not know where to look. They are upset. They are on every pill you can imagine. They are drinking themselves silly. They are trying to find answers in places that they should not even be looking. And they, they need somebody with a testimony that will say, let me tell you, if you'll just come to the church, yes, you can say that. You don't have to say, let me rebuke the devil out of you right here in the work. You can just tell them you need to get right with God. Every situation is different. I'm not trying to give you a definition. But we've got to be about our faith. Faith is for the doing. Faith is for the doing. Let me, let me hurry. I'm getting ready to close. Let me go on down. I'm going to skip a lot of things. Okay. So in our walk with God, faith, and, and I've got scriptures to back this up. I'm not going to bring it out. Faith and works go together like inhaling and exhaling. Okay. Inhaling. Alone, we will die. Exhaling, alone, we will die. But what blessings God gives us, we inhale, but we must exhale what God has done. We must have a constant interaction between what God is doing and what we are doing. What God has blessed us with and how we're blessing the Lord. Listen, if the church will be the church... We won't have room to fit the people that come into the house of God because they're going to be seeking and searching and they're going to get your seat and they're going to find, hey, they're going to take your place and thank God for it because you've shown them how to get, get in right with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Your faith will be tried. I've, I've got to hurry. I'm sorry. Your faith will be tried. You look at the scripture and you find multiple examples. Sell all you have and come and follow me. Scripture says in Matthew 19, follow me. Oh, and the Bible says he went away sorrowful because his faith was tried and it was found lacking. We could go on through. Hey, give, Abraham, give me your son. Hey, rise up and walk. Paul Harvey, <laughs> some of you don't know who he was. He was a nostalgia figure in our lifetimes when we were young. Paul Harvey spoke about faith once and said, if you don't live it, you don't really believe it. So how do you express your faith today? I want you to ask yourself, this is an internal question that you're going to ask yourself. How are you expressing your faith? How are you expressing your faith? How many times have you taken your faith to the next level and exhaled, exhaled the things of God? Our faith must be alive. It must be effective. The dictionary classifies faith as a noun. As a noun. I understand that. But true faith, and I've, I've preached a message uh, year, years ago. I'll get to it in a minute. Let me, just, let me just finish this first. True faith, true faith is actually a verb. And I know it's not in the dictionary. Like You can't find the dictionary. Under verb, it's not there. But true faith, doing, is a verb. So instead of faith... <laughs> Uh, this is where my struggle was in my title. <laughs> Instead of faith, we are faithing. <laughs> we are doing something with our faith. Not only are we faithing, <laughs> but I am a faithist. There is optimist, there is pessimist, there are realist. I am a faithist. I believe, if, <laughs> I believe that if I put myself in the hands of God and I line myself up with the will of God, that anything is possible. And if I would just get myself and humble myself and say, Lord, not my will, not my way, not the world's way, but Lord, your way. What do you ask of me? Today, I'm going to ask us, let's stand real quickly. Today, I'm going to ask you, what are you doing with your faith? What are you doing with your faith? For 20 years now, I'm not going to say we've been perfect. My wife has made a few mistakes. And, uh, and I, you know, and I say funny things at the wrong time, and I'm sorry about that too. Sister Hilly probably going all the time. Like, oh, Maybe he'll grow up one day. Oh, God. <laughs> July the 4th, I think it was, she, I got it in my calendar. I think it was July 3rd or 4th. 3rd. We met Sister Hilly. 
met some Brother Stilly. Brother Hilly made an impact on my life. He'll always, I'll never forget the man because he always had faith. He had great faith. He, he, he had great faith. Let me explain what I'm saying. Brother Hilly was a businessman, but he was a man with the right heart. When he come to victory and we started looking around for a bigger buildings, we can do it. We can do it. Now he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't dumb like some of us parents. You know, you, you give him a hundred dollar bill and say, go, go play now. <laughs> you know, he's like, we can do it. He gave his part. Got moved from building to building, got over here in the little storefront. I mean the storefront over here, and and uh, I, I got a phone call one day, brother <laughs> Brother uh, Rachel, Doug Rachel, he called me and says, Brother Keith, he, he he's an old guy, or he was was then I guess he still is but anyway um, he said Brother Keith yes sir he said they got this program called Church of the Day I said I know I've done a lot of air conditioning for them. well we want you to get one okay he said you gotta have <laughs> I wasn't lying okay I wasn't lying but I was I was operating in faith he said you gotta have 45 people the land paid for and the utilities in you got it probably probably around seventy thousand dollars can you do it yes sir I'm sure my voice cracked. <laughs> Pretty sure, anyway. I went back to Brother Hilly. I said, Brother Hilly, <laughs> it's the possibility. This is what we've got. We can do this. But we've got to have, and I told him all the things we had to do. Casper, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Man, he put his money where his mouth was. Let me tell you something. Those of us that are operating in hope, you're going to operate on hope until the day you die. But if you'll let your faith be about doing, you're going to find yourself walking in places with God that will blow your mind. I can tell you I'm there, and I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Believe me, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm not. Rephrase that. <laughs> we're not where we're going to be because God is not through working if we will have the faith. If you've gotten baptized, you need to go on to the Holy Ghost. If you've gotten the Holy Ghost, you need to go on into great growth. You need to find a place in the church where you can be about, hey, your father's business as well as I am. Hey, if you've gotten to that point and you've been in the church for 30, 50, 60, 90 years, if you're that old, you're probably pretty old anyway. If, if you've been in the church all those years, you need to, hey, I believe there's a place that you can at least find influence. I bring it in. The blessings of God. Somebody said... If God never did another thing for me, he's done enough. Oh, God. Woo! Hallelujah. Isn't that the truth? God, if you've never done another thing for me, you've done enough. But I will never be able to stop or not. I'll never be able to complete my exhaling, my, my blessing of God. The day will come. The day will come when, when uh, I will be gone and my wife will be gone and we'll go together driving down a hill, no brakes, stuff like that. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be gone. And you will have to have your own faith. You young people, you hear me today. You cannot operate off of your daddy and your mommy's faith. You need to have a revival of your own. When my son, and I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm, I know I'm dragging this out. You got to bear with me. I'm the pastor and I got the microphone. Give me a minute. When my son was about five years old, we were in church. And it was my son and his friend sitting up here on the front left side. And they began to pray. Music was going on. They began to worship. And music would stop and they would still be worshiping. And great revival broke out. Great powerful services broke out. Because there was an eight and a nine year old, a six year old that was praying in faith. Not just talking about it. But letting their prayer and their works be known unto God. Oh, God, how are you expressing your faith? How are you showing your faith today? Victory Church is a miracle, but this is not the only miracle that's supposed to happen. This is not the end of miracles. This is not the end all, be all. This is just a, a, a little step in the process. You have to have your way. You have to put your faith into action. I'm going to ask us today, if you're in this church, and I'm challenging you, I'm challenging you. If you've not received the Holy Ghost, this church is about being filled with the Holy Ghost. This, this, if this church is about anything, it is about God's power in people. Come on. 
And if you have not received the Holy Ghost, I want you to come. I want you to come and I want you to begin to just lift your hands. I'm going to walk you through it. If you need a miracle today, if you need a miracle today, I want you to first come and thank God for your last miracles. Those that you forgot, I want you to go back in your mind and say, God, you've done this. I'm going to give you thanks. That's part of faith. That's part of faith. If you need a miracle, I want you to come. If you need a situation in your life answered, if you want God to work in your life, I want you to work in his, in his will. Amen? So I'm going to invite everybody here in this church to come. I want you to come quickly. We're not going to bear. I'm, I'm already going too long. But I want you to come quickly. Scripture says in Hebrews 12, 11 and 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, for by it, by faith, the elders obtained by their actions a good report. So today, I want you to begin just to worship him for a moment. I'm going to walk those through with the needs of the Holy Ghost. I want to walk you through it in just a few moments. But I want you to just come.